All right, good evening. It is Thursday, September 30th, about 7.30, and welcome to What's on the Line, the September edition. Here we are, the last day of September. Fall is here. You can feel it in the air, and uh, I think the fishing's picking up. Um, this should make bigger fish more active, and that's part of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, some upper bay tactics and a winning strategy for the upcoming Chesapeake Fishing Open. Uh, the Chesapeake Fishing Open will be held October 9th at uh, Nick's Fish House or the Baltimore um, Yacht Basin there. And the best part about it is the middle branch of Patapsco. You can run all the way in from the bay with very little six-knot zones. So it's a great jump-off point for fishing uh, for anybody that wants to hit the middle branch and, and out you know, out into, into the bay and mouth of the Patapsco River. There's lots of great fishing out there to be had. Um, and so we're going to talk about that tonight and uh, I want to give you an idea of where you can find information to sign up for this event. Um, first, you can see scrolling along the bottom is our link tree. And so what that looks like uh, is right here. It, this, these are great to save on your, your phone, you know, on your home screen, link it. Um, if you're participating in a lot of the CCA stuff, I'd recommend you do that. This link tree gets updated every single time we have a new event coming up. When one is passed, we remove it. And it's just kind of a one quick stop for everything. And so if you click this top one, it'll take you to the Chesapeake Fishing Open, fishing tournament, where, you know, I was, I was just mentioning, and it's signing up through the iAngler platform. All right. And so this is a tournament that benefits uh, CCA's work in the Upper Bay region, as well as other organizations. Uh, we've got some, some great youth fishing uh, initiatives connected to this tournament as well, along with the trash cleanup. And uh, our friends from DNR will be out to... Um, to show folks uh, blue cats, snakeheads, do some sampling, um, do some cleaning, and and have folks see what these invasive species are like. Uh, this tournament is targeting rockfish, catfish, and snakeheads. Uh, the catfish do not have to be a blue cat, but uh, so there's a lot of different um, you know catfish species you could bring in uh, to the tournament. The, the rockfish are catch and release, at least the division, um, and so you're not bringing in your rockfish back to the dock, but folks will be bringing back catfish and snakeheads alike. Um, and so I'll talk down through it here. And actually, you know what? Let me uh, let me also mention our trash cleanup first. So that's also on the link tree here. Uh, so the second link down, if you're not an angler um, or you don't have the time to get out on the water October 9th, uh, come out and clean up some trash with us. And so that we'll be doing that. Uh, we'll provide all the safety equipment you need and instructions. It'll be nice and easy. Uh, we'll have a mapped off area in the general Nick's Fish House, uh, Port Covington area. Um, you know, thanks to the access that we're getting from our great partners like Weller and, uh, and Oasis Marinas and, and, and a lot of our great partners there, we're going to have a good time on land as well, uh, and do some things to clean up the middle branch. So click, uh, here and you'll end up on the trash cleanup website of ours. Uh, there's a simple RSVP right here. So look, you can be number one to, uh, sign up right now. If you click over there and check that out, uh, the trash cleanup participants will get a free entry into the tournament dinner. And they will get a um, a free Under Armour CCA volunteer T-shirt. So, you know, we figure the anglers are getting a T-shirt with uh, with their work or fishing on the on the water all day. You deserve a shirt as well. And thanks to our friends at Under Armour for supplying those for us. So, without further ado, let me bring in our uh, our friends. At least two or two out of the three. Kaz is running behind tonight, so we'll get talking with uh, Lenny, of course, the angler in chief at Fish Talk Magazine. And Biggin, or, or pardon me, Dave Biggin McCollum, hanging out. How are you today, uh, gentlemen? Doing good. Yeah, me too. What's happening, David? Just, you know, just staying busy. I wish I was fishing. I, I, did not fish, I did not fish today. That that night bite, it's about to start. Chew. I know where I'd be, too. Oh, okay. We might have a... A, a meeting, a riverside or, or bayside meeting here soon, gentlemen, because I need some more fishing in my life. Um, we were over on, I was on the Eastern shore today building reef balls uh, and, and moving them around. So we're building habitat like crazy. Um, and of course, trash is relates to the habitat these fish have as well. So we'll, I'll just finish by saying, you know, folks, please sign up for that trash, uh, uh, the trash cleanup and spread the word to your non-angling friends in Baltimore. Um, or anywhere. Come up to Nick's Fish House. We'll have a big party. So, Lenny, I know you were fishing uh, earlier this week. I saw some pictures. Um, rockfish, Spanish mackerel, bluefish, what'd you catch? Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, the mackerel definitely thinning out. You know, there, there are fewer and fewer. Every trip the last three in a row, 
I've seen fewer and fewer. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did only pick up one the day before yesterday. Um, we saw five or six maybe doing the greyhounding thing. Yep. But uh, we just picked up the one. We got a lot of blues. Blues are still around. Lots of little rock. Uh, I'll do a, a shout out to Zach Dittmars, uh, Fish Talks Kayak Fishing Sharpie and uh, Production Manager. He caught a 30 incher, which, nice. by the way, yeah, very nice. Uh, which, by the way, he took a couple pictures and put it right back over the side. So that fish is still swimming around out there. I know there's at least one 30 incher just south of Poplar Island, just waiting for someone to find it. Tournament fish. <laughs> well, just south of Poplar Island, that fish is going to have to. Uh, maybe strap on the easy pass and head north past the Bay Bridge because yeah. for this tournament, because it's Baltimore based, and as I mentioned, uh, very few, like very small uh, six knot zone getting into Nick's. Now you're not required to fish out of there, but if people are coming back to that, that's where we want to see those big catfish, snakeheads. You can come back in by land too. You know the rules are all on the page. This is all about just having fun and celebrating fishing that is available to people in freshwater reaches of tidal waters. Cause you have to stay in tidal waters. Um, and then in the, you know, the mix, the brackish stuff, the fresh waters of the, you know, the Susquehanna river and the tidal portion there um, all the way down to the Bay bridge is where people can go fishing. So th some of the thought process here was, all right, we'll do rockfish. Obviously they're all over. There's lots of catfish around. We want to talk to people about blue cats, but not just blue cats. There's flatheads and some decent channel cats uh, and others in this region. And then we wanted to add, of course, snakeheads too. And so the first prize for this tournament is a three fish stringer caught by at least a team or an individual or anything in between. Uh, and that three fish stringer can be all three rockfish, all three catfish, all three snakeheads, or one of each or a combination. And that's a $4,000 prize, cash prize. So the Chesapeake Fishing Opens uh, guaranteeing that first prize. And then the longest snakehead, the longest catfish, and the longest rockfish is $1,000 cash. And then as we go down in the species, there's additional prizes from our great friends at Tochterman's. Um, and so, you know, the idea is a shore angler, kayak angler, small boat angler, big boat angler can all really participate with maybe that 30-inch fish. There's 30-inch catfish and snakeheads out there that are available. So, uh, Dave, I've, uh, I know in that preview, we put a picture of a big old flathead catfish that you caught in the winter time, but do you think, uh, do you think flatheads or what kind of catfish would you be going after if, uh, if you're fishing this tournament? Um, I'd definitely be targeting blue cats. You know, the, the, the channel cats that are seem to be everywhere are, are not going to be big enough. You know, somebody's going to catch a blue cat. That's a given. And they're going to knock you out of the running, uh, flatheads. Uh, as they get bigger, they definitely get longer than blue cats, but you know, they're not as omnipresent. I mean, they're, they're not everywhere. I've caught almost every flathead catfish that I've ever caught has been out of the Susquehanna river or top of the flats. Mm -hmm. However, I've caught a flathead catfish in still pond Creek. I've caught a flathead catfish in the sassafras. I mean, so they are, pretty well distributed but for some reason they really like that upper part of the flats and the susquehanna and if you have a honey hole and you could soak some bait i mean uh flathead's a little different than targeting blue cats but that potentially would be you know if if uh you're out there every day really you know you know where those flatheads are mm -hmm. that would that would be the fish that would be a tournament winner because you know a 40 inch plus Flathead is is not that difficult to overcome once they start getting around 30 pounds, high 20s, 30, 40 pounds. They're, they're over 40 inches. You know, they're they're crazy long, almost, you know, you know, four footer. It's, you know, you hold one of those things up and it's like you're holding them at your sternum and their tails touching the ground. Whereas a blue cat kind of gets girthy. Yeah. You know, you can catch a, a 30 pound blue cat. It looks monstrous. You catch a 40 pound, it's really not that much longer. It's just starting to barrel out. You catch a 50 and you can't put your arms around it. You know, you guys hug them, you know, like, like when you catch a big redfish, it's like my, one of my funniest catches ever. I'm with, I'm with, I'm with walleye Pete and I'm holding this fish and I literally could not hold it, you know, and Pete's going, come on, you wimp, hold it out, hold it out. <laughs> I've got it pinned against my belly. And I'm like, 
you know, this is crazy. You know, when big fish get big, I mean, it's, 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 it's nuts. I mean, the blue cats, they're everywhere. So that's the neat thing about this tournament. I mean, this is a pretty special tournament. This really does. And, and I hope the word gets out to a lot of pe people because you could be standing on the shore at the Conowingo Dam down at Lapidum in the Susquehanna. And you could be soaking mud shad, soaking bunker, and you're probably not going to catch a snakehead fish, but you're going to catch a rockfish and a, and a blue cat. You know, they they share the same habitat when you get in certain areas. Some some places, no, it's it's rare that you're going to count. But when you start getting up in the Susquehanna River, hi, we call it, there's a big hole at the mouth of the Bush River. You know, in between Abbey and Lego, just inside, kind of above Super. Everybody calls it the catfish hole. You, you're going to find rockfish. You're going to find catfish. The lumps yep. off Pools Island. If you're soaking bunker there, you're about to pull up a blue cat or a striper. I mean, it's it's pretty unique that that this area is is included because you know most of the tournaments are Middle Bay, Lower Bay. You know where you know it's it's a more marine environment. Yep, and for somebody to really capitalize on this, they're going to have to sneak into the skinny water and find that snakehead and get all, get, tilt the motor up, get all grassy and, and, and get in there or get in some, you know, tributaries and then shoot out to the deeper water and get a striper or a catfish. I mean, it, it, I'm excited about it. I'm, I really don't fish any tournaments, but gosh, I, this I is so. Good. Yeah, this is so doable for for anybody, whether they're a kayak fisherman. Uh, you know, I'm I'm basically a bank bank guy. I'm a bank wrangler. I'm a shore fisherman. I mean, it's it's not hard to to wander around and 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 catch these all three of these fish. And it's it's interesting that it's you know three three biggest. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to get three thirty inch plus rockfish. I, it's doable, but. I, I would be shoot. I'd be I'd be honing in on those blue cats, you know. I, yeah. That would be my focus, and, and it seems like lately we've seen a lot of 30, 34 inch snakeheads too. So I, I I think moving around will be key, you know. Try and find that snakehead. We call the snakehead the kicker fish. Trying to find that snakehead kicker, and then concentrate on you know catching a a, a blue cat and catching a rockfish, you know. Absolutely. I've, uh, I've told myself, even though I'm not fishing the tournament, but I, I'm helping run the trash cleanup and uh, some of the other stuff throughout the day. And uh, you know, I'm a Baltimore resident and I've got a Ginu and I'm sitting here going, you know, I might just fish up by the wheel abrader and all over there and look for snakeheads. They've got to be in there. Yeah. And, you know, I drive over it all the time and think, you know, they've got to be there. They are. Yeah. So yeah, Lenny, I mean, was I talking to you yesterday? We were talking about somebody eeling and, and catching a blue cat so they caught a couple okay they were big. now dave mentioned he mentioned pools island and if if i had my druthers and i wanted j just tournament winning fish not a numbers game just purely the big fish i'd be going to the lumps on the south side of pools without hesitation and putting down live eels okay. uh, you know historically man you get some big fall rockfish doing that. Uh, you know, years ago, if if you caught a 30-incher, you'd be like, oh, look at this little one and throw it back, you know, looking for a bigger one. Um, it's not quite that way these days. But one of the beautiful things about a live eel is it like a 24-inch rockfish doesn't want to have anything to do with it, you know? You catch a rockfish on a live eel, it's going to be at least 26, more likely 28, 30, 32, and so on. And uh, it was really interesting to hear. We heard from a couple of readers, actually, who, who sent us in reader photos. And they had some honking big catfish. And I'm thinking, like, oh, okay, where'd they soak the bunker? You know? No. No, they were dropping live eels at pools. So those lumps, man, that's that's a winning strategy right there. That, I, I, I think that's a, that's a big fish strategy. If you want numbers, head for the bridge, right? Bridge is going to be crowded. Everyone knows their structure there. There's fish there. You can throw jigs. You can catch a lot of fish. Maybe you'll get a big one. But if you really want to hone in on like the tournament winning fish, I'm saying eels at pools is going to be a bullseye. 
All right, all right. Well, I wanted to put up, uh, trying to figure out what I'm doing here. I'm missing my buttons here. Everybody should know by now. There's great fishing reports always available at fishtalkmag.com slash fishing dash reports. Um, and tons of great tips like what we're talking about tonight. So don't forget that. Uh, Lenny is the angler in chief there. And, uh, and as we mentioned, Zach Dittmars does such a great job with, um, with so much of the, of the putting the magazine together and is a top notch angler himself. I think I saw a, a little video about trot lining for crabs, uh, from out of the kayak. Can you believe he pulls that off with great success? Yes. Yes. That blows my mind. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> he has a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> and he had work, to work in this work. <laughs> All right. So, um, Let's talk snakeheads for a little bit. Um, Kaz was going to join us. I know he's been uh, stretched into a lot of work with crabbing season. Still going on. I've, I'm, there's still a little bit of catch of crabs, and I know Kaz is out there working hard. Um, so he may jump in here, and if he does, we'll add him. But, uh, Dave, you're no slouch when it comes to the snakeheads. I know, yeah, uh, I'm a cherry picker, though, you know? <laughs> Molly, nobody hears anything from me about snakeheads come August, September, October. Boom. I show up on the snakehead radar like late April, May to like 4th of July. And and the reason that is, is, you know, I, I like to work my, my home waters. I, I like to fish where I live and I just keep working them and working them and working them because it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a lifetime. And, uh, snakeheads just literally came to my, I live at the top of the hill from the Conowingo dam and snakeheads came to me. You yep. know, I, it, it's, it's just, it's kind of strange to see how quickly they've exploded into the river, but I've got my fingers crossed and, you know, just from past experiences with invasives like the flatheads, there is an explosion or expansion mm -hmm. and then hopefully there's a decline and, and then we'll get a balance and everybody can stop button heads about, Oh God, you know, <laughs> kill all the snakeheads or, Oh, what, a, you know, we don't know. It's just, it's one of those things where it's, we have no idea. We have no idea. I mean, obviously a fish that breeds multiple times a year, obviously a fish that protects its young, obviously a fish that's an apex predator. He's going to make an impact in any environment he, that, you know, he inserts himself into. So whether or not mother nature handles that in a favorable way for all, all parties to play nice, we'll, we'll wait and see, you know, I don't, I don't like to, you know, I, obviously I, I don't kill every fish I catch. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not always in a position to harvest fish. Sometimes you just want to go out and have fun and, you know, lugging a, a dead fish around with you. Just it just it doesn't fit into the, you know, the matrix of the activity. And also it's just yeah. I don't fish to go out and kill things, you know, but I do harvest snakeheads. And uh, you, when they come here, they come everywhere, man. And they they come pretty much on the piggybacks of the white perch and the hickory shad and the American shad, all the spring runs are followed or either they're enmeshed with this massive snakehead dispersal and all the little tributaries up here on the flats and uh, on the, in the river proper. And they're literally just, it seems like they're everywhere. I mean, you can't catch them as, as many as you catch white perch or you catch shad, you know, every cast. Some days it, it damn near seems like it. And then they just kind of start to peter out. And, you know, this little, you, you know, you're working hard to catch a fish or two. Whereas the other day, you know, you were catching a dozen of them. And then they pretty much disappear. And I mean, I wouldn't think they're all 100% gone mm -hmm. from these waters. But these are fast, rocky, you know, these are fast moving rivers, you know, and it's, they're probably not real successful spawning in these kind of places because, you know, they can't stick with their fry and the Susquehanna, you know, right. Vacillating right. water flows out of the dam. What was, you know, a high bank one day is a dry bank the next day. So it's kind of, it, it's kind of tough, but as soon as you get onto the flats, then it's that's snakehead, you know, snakehead territory. Yeah. And then as the summer moves along, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. The grass I mean, you've been out on the flats. It's like you look out on that thing, and it's it's pretty much impassable in some areas. It's like you could take a lawnmower over it. Yeah. it it's just it's crazy. And you look. I look for pockets. I look for pockets. I look for clear water. I mean, it's you you can blind cast a frog in grass, and just snakeheads will magically appear. But 
that's just that's tough because you'll you'll get 30 strikes or 30 blow ups and none of them will inhale it. They'll just smack it as it comes through the grass over their head. So Mm -hmm. I, I look somewhere where I can get a little subsurface or I've got open water where I can work a frog. Or I really like to work a, a you know a weightless fluke and mm-hmm. just twitch it just under the surface, and it just seems like it you know it's easier to sight fish and it's easier to address you know a fish in a certain spot. Plus, I I, I think they can approach it and attack it yeah, a lot easier. I think that's why you miss so many when you're frogging in thick grass. They right. just yeah, they just they just react and whack at it. And I it's, was it's, th- you, you got to remember that people I think forget that. When a fish opens its mouth and flares its gills, it's sucking water in. And that's why a subsurface bite is the natural thing. It's easy for them to catch. They're sucking it in. Almost every fish, even the ones that bite, like a blue, a mac, you know, macs are different. They're slicing them in half and coming back and picking up the pieces. But, you know, the snakehead, he's got a little suck factor going on there. And they can't do that to the frog. So it makes sense. And, heck, so many of them can injure their prey, then come back and get them. Um, Right. So... The uh, so fluke wise, are you like what are you somewhere something on the small edge of or small side? I've always heard that I on size for snakeheads or no, you know, I just use zoom super salty fluke, just the, the generic standard issue. It's it's not expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you learn real quick when you're using a worm hook, and I use like a seven eight, you know, seven eight dot worm hook. And uh, I just fish them weedless, no weight, no weight whatsoever. But you learn which soft plastic is really buoyant because you want it to slow sink and you don't want to be able to twitch it. You know, some of the stuff like those little DOAs, you know, and, and the bass assassins, some of them aren't. I don't know why. They're just, I guess, different densities or different materials of rubber. They don't sink really. So one twitch and it just shoots up to the surface. And then, you know, you can get away with that by using a, a weighted, you know, like a one sixteenth or a one thirty seconds, a weighted worm hook. You know, I'm sure everybody's seen them for fishing different swim baits. So that helps you out if, if you don't have an ample supply of a, of a soft plastic that's kind of, I guess you would call it neutrally buoyant. Right. I use Zoom's super salty fluke. I, I don't think I've ever u- experimented with colors. I I'm a real keep it simple. I'm a real minimalistic fisherman when it comes to all types of fishing. I mean, I use white ice. <laughs> it's a a pearl white with glitter in it. I mean, it's it's a bait fish, and yeah. you know, I maybe there'll be a day when I'm not hitting them, and if I wasn't so hard headed, I could switch to chartreuse glitter, and I might have caught fish. I don't <laughs> know, but I don't have any on me. I mean, I own them. But uh, when I go out, I like to just take a minimal amount of stuff with me and use it. And I know it works. And, you know, God, how many colors are there? It's all plastic. Plenty. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's nuts. It's nuts. You know, it's like I like to just, you know, like I, I'll do something exotic. It would be like electric chicken. <laughs> you know, chartreuse glitter and white. You know, you I, I've never I have caught on chartreuse. And I have caught on some like glows with mm-hmm. chartreuse tails on snakeheads, but I couldn't see the fish. I was just jigging bottom and I jig the exact same way that you would jig up slow jig bottom bouncing it for a walleye or mm-hmm. cold water stripers where you're not really snap jigging a mile a minute. Just that slow hang, a little bump, 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 almost like speck fishing. Mm-hmm. I've caught a lot of snakeheads bottom bouncing and I've caught walleye. And like, ooh, got a snake. <laughs> Get it. It's a walleye. Oop, got a snake head. You know, I bounce back and forth. I've had days when I've caught stripers, smallmouth, walleye, and snake head, all pretty much back to back. Same technique. Now, Dave, you, you said in the springtime, there are times when it almost seems like you're catching one like every cast. Yep. So Man, I didn't get a phone call. Could, could I please ask for a phone call? Next time? I have to admit, have to admit I got a phone call, but I live like I'm half as close to him or whatever you want. Come on, it's a not, phone call, man. Okay, it's not the type of fishing that most people enjoy, you know? You got to remember, you're not alone when you're at the Conowingo Dam. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a struggle for me because I generally don't like to be around people at all, man. 
and it's there's there's a a, a a real cast of characters and your line's gonna get crossed you know <laughs> somebody's gonna stomp on walk literally walk where you were fishing they're gonna walk out past you because snakeheads come to the edge yeah. you know they, and they, they don't want to be in that you know they're generating water that's moved blowing by you know 25 miles an hour you know 30,000 cubic feet per second. They don't want to be in that. There's not too many fish that do. And, you know, when fish are migrating or when they're moving, they navigate along the shoreline. People were going to stomp through the fish you are catching. People are going to throw over your line. You might as well engineer about one hour of untangling your line with somebody else's line <laughs> in the course of three or four hours of fishing. One hour of it is going to be like managing your tackle. Because somebody beside you doesn't know what you're doing. It's like, Lenny, if I called you up and said, get up here to the dam, man, it's blowing up. We got this, that. You would fish for probably 15, 20 minutes and go, oh, man, this ain't fishing. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, first off, I think I'd love that. But second off, that sounds a lot like my life before boats. <laughs> but Absolutely. So, Lenny, you grew up in Baltimore. Yes, I did. Shore fishing spots around town? Oh, man. So, uh, woof. so I was near Lake Roland. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was actually my backyard lake. Now, the harbor back then, you know, we didn't fish it. Now, later on, we did. Like, when I was in my 20s, probably. So, about, I don't know, like 80 years ago or something. <laughs> uh, you know, we started to realize that the harbor actually is shockingly full of fish yeah. i mean it, it really it is. is yeah there's endless structure you got some water discharges in some different spots um you have uh tons of rockfish tons of catfish tons of white perch you know i can't say i fished the harbor for them but I, there gotta be snakeheads there too right mm -hmm. um you know i know they're thick in curtis creek that is literally right around the corner i mean yep. they gotta be in there they gotta be Yep, yep. Yeah, guys catch them in Canton, you know, just I, right around I, the corner. I would be shocked if they didn't, you know. And, and I got to tell you, one of my sons recently uh, moved up to the city, and he's a kayak guy. He likes fishing the kayak. And he very rapidly discovered, you know, just how good the Patapsco can be. It, it It's kind of shocking. But Yeah, that's, that's another spot where targeting, you know, Fort Howard, you know, inside mouth of Curtis Creek, all the way up to Fort McHenry. I mean, you literally could catch a snakehead, a blue cat, and a striper. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, and these channel edges too. I mean, what? So, Lenny, you were out the other day for rockfish, and I, what breaking breaking on bait still, or are they? Yeah, we had bird play. Bird play, okay. We had bird play. Now, I do. I you know, I should say uh, we had bird play the day before yesterday. Two days before that. We had bird play that wasn't great, but we caught our bigger fish in the shallows afterwards on the sunset bite. Yeah. And that, for me, this season in particular, I'm going to say ever, actually, really, ever since the end of August, that's when I've been catching the bulk of my decent-sized rockfish. has been in six, seven, eight feet of water, you know, from four or five o'clock in the evening on. It's been a, a late deal. Um, it, it has not been a top water thing. I've not done great on top water, thrown it a couple times in shallower spots. Hasn't, I expect that to pick up, you know, I think it's still been a little early for that as of yet, but it's been jigs, half ounce jig heads, uh, four, five inch, four, five inch white paddle tails or BKDs, uh, just bouncing them along the bottom and, you know, six, eight feet of water where you got a little bit of structure that's getting hit by a little bit of current. That's sort of been the ticket. Now, in this tournament, of course, I'm a little further south, but in this tournament, if I was fishing up north, you know, I'd be looking at spots like the first one that jumps to my mind for that kind of fishing would be the mouth of the Magathy. Mm -hmm. You got a great shoal at the mouth of the Magathy that sees good current. Yep. It's got good shallow water. I mean, historically, it draws in fish. Um, you know, Bodkin, the rocks off Bodkin, the old lighthouse ruins. Ooh, daybreak. That could be a tournament winner. Uh, Daybreak or sunset, that's a really good spot. Um, don't go in there if your boat draws more than a couple feet of water, or right. you will regret it. Right. But, you know, even seven-foot knoll, mm -hmm. um, you know, man of war. Man of war. Spots, 
yeah, those kind of spots could definitely produce some nice fish in the next week or two here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's a ton of shallow water structure too, all through the, the harbor and the creeks we mentioned already too. Oh, so. God, yes. And uh, sun, I, I believe lines in is uh, seven o'clock. So that's sunrise right now. Um, you know, sunrise will be a few days later or a few minutes later uh, next week uh, on the 9th. Um, so I think that makes a lot of sense for folks to, to start with a, you know, shallow morning kind of approach to rockfish and, uh, you know, maybe slide out to any of these spots we were talking about already for, um, for some catfish. So let me ask you a question, Dave. I got a question. Yep. I'm wondering this here because my favorite thing about this tournament, what I really love is the fact that there are people out there pulling garbage out of the water. Yep. I mean, that's just magnificent. That's like super cool. Yep. Right. So, and, and they're getting a t-shirt and they go to the party. Right? Yeah. They get the party at Nick's. They get to hang out and have a good time. And yeah. So now if I'm fishing in the tournament, but I'm not collecting trash, do I get a t-shirt? Yeah. You get a tournament okay. t-shirt. It's a little bit different. Okay. So, well, here's the question. Can we do both? Yeah. Yeah. What if I go out and I catch fish and I get a bunch of trash? I think that's a great idea. And if you do that, you're going to get a t-shirt as well. So I love it. there you go, Lenny. You just, you, everybody owes Lenny a thank you. If you uh, participate <laughs> and, and get your, your trash cleanup t-shirt and your tournament t-shirt. I think it's a great idea. Awesome. Yeah. And I will say that we, uh, I was in with, at, in Tockerman's last week, uh, Tony and D of course are just, as good as it gets in this business and uh, such a treasure to, to charm city. Uh, they make it charm. They make, they bring the charm, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, this tournament does uh, benefit CCA and other groups. And even before this tournament's occurring, we went ahead and went out and purchased, uh, I ordered 100 spinning rod combos for kids. Um, and so we're going to have some kit, uh, hopefully have some youth anglers participating in fishing in some way in, in connection with this tournament. Um, and we've already gotten the, the rods that they're going to be going home with and some tackle packages and stuff. So, you know, we're hoping to, to work with kids that are, are looking to get into fishing. And uh, and that's part of what you're supporting um, by, by fishing in this tournament. So you get your $75. Um, again, if folks are just chiming in, um, $75 a person, you get your shirt, you're going to get a swag bag. It's going to have a bunch of great stuff from all the different partners. Uh, there's going to be chances to win multiple things kind of randomly. Uh, we're going to throw that in towards uh, kind of surprises day of. Uh, there'll be a great captain's party on uh, on the eighth Friday night uh, before at Nick's Fish House, um, and we're we're bringing back the uh, Baltimore chapter meetings. Um, so actually, next Thursday it, you'll see an email tomorrow about it. Uh, but next Thursday, the Baltimore chapters meeting um, out at uh, Jerry D's. Um, so we're, we're bringing it back. Our chapter meetings. Uh, it's something we're we're calling Anglers Night. So it's a, a good surprise. news. Yep. Yep. And so, you know, we realize maybe not everybody's ready to gather yet, but we're going to, we're going to be talking about, you know, all the things we love to talk about at our chapter meetings and, uh, and kind of get CCA back and rocking and rolling. Um, Matt actually asked a question here. Are the catfish required to be brought to the dock? No, they are not, Matt. Um, we'd love to have you bring them back, but we're not requiring that. Uh, you would submit them through iAngler. If you want to bring them back to the dock, we'll do gut sampling, cleaning, um, we're trying to work out a situation where any fish that are donated can, uh, can be, be donated to the food bank, but aren't there yet. Uh, you know, it all depends on some, some final details that are coming together right now, but we'd love to have you bring them back, but if you don't, that's okay. Um, and again, all the, all the specific rules are on the page here. Um, and you can let me know or, uh, or, um, send a message here to the Chesapeake fishing open at gmail.com with any questions ahead of the tournament. And I'll make sure uh, that folks are, are clear on exactly what's going on. Um, and again, there's, uh, details about the party and awards ceremony. Um, and if you're, again, if you're just chiming in $4,000 for the three fish stringer, that can, could be three rock, three cat, three snakehead, or any combination of them. Dave, you, you just made me think of another question. Can I ask okay. one more? Oh, ask away. We're halfway so, through our night. I'm fishing in the tournament. Mm -hmm. I catch a blue or a cat or a, or a flathead cat or snakehead. Can that does that also count for an entry for the invasive species count? It sure does. The Great Chesapeake Invasives count is is running through October thirty first. So right. any catch of these invasive species, you should enter into the Great Chesapeake Invasives count. And uh, we've got some actually really cool stuff coming up for that. I showed it before, but let me grab it off my wall. I'll be sad. I'll be sad when I have to get rid of this. This is like um, a double dip tournament. 
You can you can win prizes in so many different directions. Exactly. And this snakehead, we haven't announced it yet, but great Chesapeake Invasives count. This is going to be a prize for somebody in October. You're definitely going to have to be a CCA member. So free to enter the tournament. Busy. But there it is. So, and this is going to be based off fish caught in October. <laughs> Not just, <laughs> hey, you know, I can sign up online. I want you out there catching fish, reporting your catch, and that custom snakehead from Blue Water Copper Works is going to have to leave my wall and head to yours. The redfish stays. That, one, that one's mine. Oh, you got a redfish? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Haynes Hoffman, buddy, down in Brevard, North Carolina, Blue Water Copper Works. Wow. Look at this. Taxidermy quality eyes. This is a fly. Uh, I actually caught a grand slam on Belize in Belize on this fly. Um, but Haynes hand cuts and hand hammers and then uses heat to finish these these uh, these fish. Actually, the, the pickerel tournament, um, which is coming back very soon here, um, our pickerel championship. I think, Lenny, you've got a copper pickerel in your wall somewhere, don't you? What? It's right up there. Yep. There's the pickerel. Yep. There he is. Oh, hold on. We got some questions coming. All right. So, lifelong Jersey guy. Did I hear Lenny correct? This is the time of year he recommends jigging, live lining at sunrise for rock, and then moving deeper to bay channels later morning or afternoon. Well, I didn't mention live lining. Um, but, but, you know, to a degree, yes. And to a degree, no, I mean, this weather is rapidly changing and these fish are constantly moving. What's going to happen right now, the, the pattern that I've been finding effective. Yes, that's what it's been. But what's happening right now, we're seeing to a large degree, the peanut bunker are pushing out of the rivers. They've started moving out, um, out on the South. I was noticing the last two runs out. The fish are out of the creeks, the, the, the young of the year. They're, they're about that big right now. Rockfish know this is going on, and they're in the process of changing their patterns right now. There's no doubt in my mind. In the next few weeks, what's going to happen is you're going to start seeing in the reports, you'll see it. You'll see the, the mouth of the Severn, the mouth of the South, the mouth of the Magathy. As these peanut bunker move out, the rockfish start moving to those river mouths, and they're going to be hunting right around those river mouths. Um, in the upper bay, it, it'll happen around the river mouths, particularly the Chester. Chester's really good for that kind of action, the lower Chester. But you're also going to see them more in the main stem bay up there because it's a little more um, compact, mm -hmm. right? And, and as the bunker start to move out and down, they're much more quickly in the main stem. Um, and those areas like pools, uh, Tolchester, they're, they're going to they're gonna start getting really, really active. Of course, Tolchester has been active, but that's with spot. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's going, we're, we're in the midst of a change here, but it has been for me personally, it's, it's been more of a late evening than an early morning thing. Um, that has nothing to do with the fact that I don't like to get up early. <laughs> and most of my fishing takes place after work hours. I'm sure that has nothing to do with it, but for me, <laughs> It's it's been a late it's been an evening thing it has been shallow it has been jigs but I do expect this to be changing right now it's it's going to be the river, river mouths or you know you're going to be hearing about that more and more and more in the coming weeks so Lenny I've got a good one for you this came from a good hunting buddy that uh, I would say that this is his excuse for wanting to sleep in but he said you know I'm not big a big fan of waking up early because. Yeah, you know, the morning starts and it's this great thing you get excited for and the fishing or in his case that he's talking about the hunting it's great right at shooting time like waterfowl hunting and it gets worse and worse and worse and there's less of a chance of it being successful if you flip it in the evening you know you're going up it's getting darker and darker and darker and you're maybe the fish are picking up and picking up it gets, it gets exciting and yeah all good things come to an end but that was his excuse for preferring to do things in the evening he's, he's like you know it just keeps getting better and better and better and when it's over, that's fine. You can go home. Anyway. I have to steal that excuse. Yeah. It's, it's true. Yeah. I just in fact, you know. The, uh, the water temperature in the Susquehanna River for the last three days has not been above 69 degrees. As wow. a matter of fact, right now it's 66. So, you know, if you're fishing any of these flats, tribs, elk, northeast, you know, the bush even, anything up here, that – People don't realize how much water comes down that river. Yep. 
And that's a lot of cool, cool. I mean, I'm sure the flats right now are just – there's influx, obviously, because it's tidal. Yep. But there's never really a time in the lower river where the tide, like, overtakes the current unless it's a, a, a big, you know, a drought year. Yeah. But they're, they're running uh, 80,000 cubic feet per second right now, and water temperature is 66 degrees. What's the, uh, what's the average right now if it weren't for these two back-to-back rainstorms? Like what? What would you expect this time of year compared to what it is now? Not this much water. Yeah. Yeah, more like forty thousand, thirty to forty thousand. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I see. We Pennsylvania, York County, and Lancaster County got pretty much identical rainfall that last rain event as they did from Ida. Yeah. So it's like we had a double whammy. We were kind of we got saved because that last rain event, it went out off the coast. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it went through like Lancaster County and then right, right out through Philly and, and New Jersey and went off the coast. If that last rain event would have gone up the river Valley, like up 81, you know, into upstate New York and just, just drain the whole mother load, we'd have been screwed. Like Ida did. Ida lingered, mm-hmm. you know, it soaked us. And then the next day it's soaking Harrisburg. You know, and the next day it's in Binghamton, New York, and it's in Syracuse. You know, it it crept along and dumped a lot of water. And, and we were in like spill condition for two weeks straight. We had like a week. Today is the first day they actually opened Fisherman's Park. It's been closed <laughs> since Ida. And then this last rain event, just because they've been managing the lake level. Now, some of it was due to maintenance on the dam. They weren't running large turbines for like three weeks. So in order to manage the lake level, they open a spill gate. Well, when they open a spill gate, you know, it's in their verbiage that the park is closed. You know, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't really a flood conditions. And then, boom, we got hit with that last rain. We got four or five inches of rain up here. That was nuts. Man. Yeah. Well, it just drains such a large area. Yeah. And then it has such a huge impact. It's kind of entertaining. Like the mid bay people, they blame the Conowingo Dam. Oh, it's Conowingo opening them damn gates. It's mother. How nature. dare you? It's How mother dare nature. you? The waters, the waters coming down. I mean, they got no choice. Yeah, I, I don't discount the challenges that we face with the sediment and everything happening with oh. the, that dam in, in general. But you're right. I mean, the water's coming and. I always, I just wonder what the bay would look like without that dam in place. Um, all that sediment would already be in place in the upper bay. It'd be, and it's not a matter of better or worse, but you're right. It's uh, the water's coming down all over the place. Tough runoff, bad runoffs coming oh, down all man, over the without place. Without that dam there, oh God. I mean, it, people would be catching striped bass and American shad and Harrisburg and yeah. you know, up in Duncan. I mean, it, They'd be going into the Juniata. They'd be going into Penn's Creek. I mean, those fish, there's there's eel weirs and shad weirs that are built on Penn's Creek up by State College, Pennsylvania, by Native Americans, mm-hmm. you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years ago to intercept those anadromous fishes, you yep. know, hundreds of hundreds of miles away. Yeah. I mean, it, obviously, with more dispersal, you know, they'd have a healthier population, more diversity. I mean... Yeah. yeah, we we stuck we stuck the entire coastal fishery. We just slammed the door shut on them, and then obviously it was fishing the barrel. It was fishing a barrel for you yeah. know for everybody, and they just they just it's sad, but you know that's what we do. We we just take advantage of a resource. They just raped that that Susquehanna and Susquehanna Flats. I mean, they're you know they had shad processing houses out on the river. You know, and guys would dead, you know, guys would stay out on those things. They'd run 24 hours. They'd process the shad, salt it, and they'd run it right there at Lapidum. If you're at Lapidum boat launch, there's still little piers for the rail cars that would go onto the train. And so they'd run those shad carts. They go right on the rails. There's there's still those little piers there from those rail carts and they go right on the train. And of course, that's before the Conowingo Dam, before 1928. And they load them right onto the train. Same way they do with Atlantic salmon up in upstate New York. They just tr- train cars, like instead of full of coal, full of salted fish. I mean, you can, you can only support that so long. Yep. You're, uh, you almost got me borderline depressed over here. I think, thankfully, I'm 
kicking plastic up in uh, the office tonight. So there you go. Cheers to better times, maybe in the in the future. Uh, let me yeah. get to a, let me get to a couple questions real quick that are uh, that popped up. Well, Matt made a statement. Seems like there should be a prize for the biggest stringer of the three different species. So I know I haven't gone over it yet, and uh, I'm going to read the right from the page. What are the um, the prizes here? So I mentioned the grand prize, largest three fish stringer by length, any combination of rockfish, striped bass, snakehead, or catfish. Um, thousand dollar first place prize, longest fish by length for each species. So longest striper, longest snakehead, longest catfish, thousand each. Second place prize is a five hundred dollar five hundred dollar gift card. Same breakdown, uh, and then third place is. Two hundred fifty dollar gift card to Tockerman's, uh, same breakdown. One one per the longest or third longest of each species. Top lady angler, we're going to award the longest fish of any of the qualifiers um, to a, the top lady angler, and then uh, uh, the same thing for the youth, um, top youth. And I, like I said, we'll have some surprises. We'll bring in uh, prize wise, and generally speaking, uh, these tournaments, especially this one that's relatively new. Uh, this is the um, the first one was in 2019 before the pandemic, and then it was canceled last year. Um, participation drives the ability for the tournament and the sponsors to justify prizes and different structures. And um, there's no perfect way to design these. So feedback is great, especially from those that are participating. Um, I know that I can speak for all the folks supporting this event that more feedback's better uh, than less. And uh, we want to make it a good time. Um, you know, we've got a lot of great businesses that are all in on this event this year. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to educate a lot of folks about invasive species and, and just fishing in general and the opportunities that exist in Baltimore. And like I already mentioned, we're going to be uh, also giving out some some fishing rods to some kids, and this tournament's helping fund those. Um, so you're going to see a lot of uh, youth angling events in 2022 for CCA. So stand by, um, and, uh, and we'd love to have some folks involved. Um, and again, this is a, a tournament that CCA benefits from, and I'm proud to help uh, shape it into the future and, and would ask any any feedback. So um, Kevin McMenamin has a question. Lenny, you mentioned that the peanut bunker have started to move out of the rivers. Have you ever used a cast net to get a bunch of peanut bunker for bait fishing in the fall? Absolutely, Kevin. Uh, yeah, uh, highly effective. Uh, two ways to go about it. Uh, first thing I should mention is as soon as they push out of areas, say five, six feet or less, you got to go to a pretty big cast net, like a six footer isn't going to cut it. You need an eight footer, a 10 footer, fairly wide mesh. So it sinks quick. Once you're in eight, 10, 12 feet of water, the bunker will swim out from under a slow sinker. So you got to have a pretty big, pretty fast sinking net. Uh, I throw a 10 footer, I think it's quarter inch mesh. Um, and that sucker's heavy. I mean, I can do four or five throws and I'm like done. Um, it's, it's a workout. Uh, Isn't that what the boys are for? It's hard to throw a 10 footer, man. I don't it even is. try. Uh, I get tired of watching, but you will get them. So that's the, that's the one thing, right? Number two is if you want to cheat, <laughs> there's a way to cheat. You get your six footer, right? Which is easy to throw. Uh, and what you do is you go out about a half an hour before daybreak and you go to the end of lighted piers that are outside of the creeks, but on the main river, those lighted piers will have the, I don't know why bunker do it. Do we know why they swim in circles like that? The school swims in this little circle. Yeah. I don't know. Vortex. I, other yeah, than, yeah, like than a bunker vortex. If, yeah. The schooling thing kind of, you know, that you get that schooling and it, it protects them and makes them look maybe more bigger, you know, like a bait ball. And oh. they do that definitely when they're being attacked. I mean, I hope you've seen the videos of sailfish, you know, yeah, eating, yeah. Uh, bait off Isla down in, you know, Mexico, that kind of stuff. And I think it's a defense mechanism, but the, you're right. The men hadn't seem to be in that ball spinning when they're feeding yep. or when they're running from predators, no matter what. They do that spinning thing. And yeah. under the lights, on the lighted piers, they'll be doing that like nuts. And you just creep up to one of them, throw the cast net. They're at night like that. They're right up on the surface, right under the light. I, I say at night. I meant before the sun comes up. Yeah. Uh, and it's really easy to net them. You you take one good throw with a six footer under a brightly lit pier. You know, half an hour before sunset, you may often you'll pull in that cast net, and it'll have like three times too many bunker to put in a live well. <laughs> like yeah. like you can't you know you can't use them all. So it, it absolutely works. A um, couple other minor points. Bunker are much more sensitive than spot. If you got a live wall that'll hold 30 spot, don't put more than 20 bunker in it. 
you know, because they'll, they'll start to die off real quick. Um, same thing with a hook. You need a thin wire hook. If you use a thick hook, the bunker will not live long, and you can't pin their mouth shut. I Most, most bait fish, I like to go in through the bottom, draw out through the top. You do that with a bunker. You know, if he gets bit in five minutes, great. If he's not, he's dead because they just can't breathe right when right. their mouth is pinned shut. So you can go through the nose, kind of stinks. They could turn sideways a lot of the time. The hook ends up sticking back into the, the side of the bunker. Um, but but that works works best in a current uh, when the boat is static because they just kind of get pulled behind the hook. Uh, and then, of course, you can go you know right behind the dorsal. But again, thin wire hook. Um, yep. Thin wire, right thin wire circle hook. Circle. Thank you, David. You're welcome. This this one is actually a. This is a six o. This is smaller than I would recommend, but uh, there's been a pack that exploded like a year ago, and every once in a while I just find one. But thankfully they're circle hooks, so it's not in my foot when I step on it. Yeah, that's a scoop on the peanut bunker, Kevin. I know Kevin. Kevin's got a pier behind his house, and I'm saying right now, Kevin, if you don't have that thing lighted up already, come on, man, get the light. We'll be out there in the morning. <laughs> and so drop me a pin, Kevin. Um, no, and also uh, something else about about bunker and live wells is because of that swimming in the circle deal, they're going to last a lot longer in a circular live well with, with the round corners um, swimming. Otherwise, look at that bloody nose and die quickly. Um, they're they're not good at square square live to live wells. They are, yeah, they are not good at square. Nope. And if you're fishing for blue cats, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter if they're dead or alive. No, right, wait, so, wait, 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 hold on now, because I now I want to know about this because I'm I can't claim to be a blue cat expert, but I've been told that the real blue cat sharpies like liveies. Yeah, sure. I mean, live is always better, and the bigger fish, the bigger fish, yep. I think are are more predatory. You know, they want they want a quick, they want a good meal and gulp it down, and you know, instead of pecking through, like a lot of people will chunk for them. And you, when you mentioned eels, you know. That, there's some duality there. Obviously, you're you're probably hoping you're going to catch a rockfish, but a lot of the hardcore blue cat fishermen, especially up here on the river in the flats, they cut the eels up. You know, yeah. they use one eel and, and just use a chunk of an American eel, not yeah. necessarily use the live eel. You know, yeah. interesting. They'll chunk. You know, they call everybody up here calls mud shad bluefish candy, a blue blue cat candy. Yeah, mud shad's blue cat candy. You know, it's like yeah. The bunker, if you can get it, works great too. But it doesn't seem to matter, you know, up here, you know, whether it's alive, you know, or it's dead. I mean, maybe if you're in the Potomac and you're targeting 40, 50, 60 pound fish, you want to throw a nice 12, 15 inch live bunker down there. It might make a difference. But it's, we don't have those fish yet here. It's, it's, it's kind of been a, it's been a great science experiment, you know, just observing. Because yep. these fish are definitely a class of fish. Same mm -hmm. with the snakeheads. You know, two years ago, oh, you caught a 30-incher, right? And I was like, wow, I didn't. Last year, as you know, I, I turned in a bazillion fish. I didn't. This year, 30 inches was, <laughs> you know, I, days where I caught two 30-inchers. You know, yep. and that class of fish, whenever that was, whether those are four-year-old fish or three-year-old fish or five-year-old fish, I don't know, but that class is giant, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, there's, and next year, we're going to see 12 to 15 pound, 34 inch fish. Like this year, uh, a 28 to 31 inch, you know, snakehead fish was not uncommon. And there was a ton caught with yeah. the blue cats. It's the same thing. I've not caught one bigger than 42 pounds in this river. And I'm sure people probably have. But the bulk of the guys that go out there and fish for them routinely, you're going to catch a lot of 30s and maybe a couple 40s. Last year, it was like 20s and 30s. Before that, man, 22 pounds. I didn't even get a 30 pounder. So this is definitely this that gives a little credence to the fact that this is an initial expansion, yeah. you know, or explosion because these fish, I'm guessing next year we'll see 50s, you know, and we'll see a lot of them. Like, you know, I'm, Everybody that fishes for blue cats, and I tinker with it occasionally, everybody catches a 40-pounder, whereas that was bragging lights last year. This year, it's a common fish. So that's it's, it's kind of one interesting observation. There's definitely a huge 
you know, class of fish. Well, I, I don't know how old they are. I'm, I'm going to guess they're four or five years old. They yeah. may grow that fast. Yeah. I'm going to answer Eddie's they're... question real quick. Uh, it popped up. Eligible fishing waters for this tournament are the Bay Bridge or the Kent Narrows Bridge. So 5301 to the north to the Conowingo and the tidal tributaries in between. So you've got a lot of area for all three species, uh, catfish and not specific to blue, blue cats, any catfish, uh, snakeheads and rockfish. We've been talking about how a lot of these waters overlap. And, and Dave, I think you raised some really good points that speak to like make total sense to me uh, being involved in fisheries management. Um, you know, we focus on rockfish. We talk about young of year and Chesapeake anglers, depending where you are in the Bay, you're going to be able to interact with almost all the age classes of juvenile rockfish um, throughout the year, anywhere from very tiny, or you might even catch some in a cast net, throw them back gently. Um, <laughs> you know, they're small, they're born here. Right. And then they're up to, six, seven years old, and then even older than that, resident males. Um, you get the females that come through. You know, we learn more every year. Um, in fact, my mother caught a rockfish. She hasn't been rockfishing in probably 40 years. Tagged Fish and Wildlife Service rockfish. It was tagged by Josh Newhart and their team. Or, I'm sorry, Beth Ursack and her team at Maryland DNR, and then Josh uh, Fish and Wildlife Service sent out this uh, this certificate for mom there, um, but anyway, so all this information that that goes into fisheries management is looking at exactly what you're talking about, Dave. You're observing year classes. You're observing an abundance at a certain level, and there's a lot of studies being done right now throughout the watershed to better understand what definitely snakeheads are doing. Um, I know Josh and his team at Fish and Wildlife working with DNR as well. I've been tagging fish on the west side, um, you know, the Baltimore County, Harford County, to try and get at these migratory patterns and stuff. Um, I don't know what's going on with any blue cat tagging up there, but I know uh, Tony Petraska's team at Maryland DNR, along with some federal partners um, in the freshwater division, are doing really good work, or inland division are doing good work in the Patapsco, I'm sorry, the Patuxent, to understand blue cat migration. And so knowing where these fish are at certain times of year, how much they grow when they're tagged from one spot to another is key in fisheries management. And we see it right on the water. So like that, that's a big part of the data that we're capturing in the Great Chesapeake Invasives Count. They're getting a look at a lot of different fish. They're getting the length of the fish, where they're caught, maybe some stomach contents. And actually we do that with these tournaments too. We report our catches to DNR so they can eventually piece together these, these things we're seeing on the water. And I, Every chance I, I get to talk about how valuable our data can be for our, our management agencies, I talk about it. So you, you explained exactly uh, what folks might be seeing out in the water. And I'd encourage folks that are uh, fish nerds like me to dig into it a little bit. And actually, it can help you become a better angler because not only um, will you understand kind of the, the annual cycle of these fish if you pay attention to this stuff, You'll know when to target what and when not to if you if if the surveys are correct and um, you know quite often they are. Yeah, the one thing that's really strange is the clam thing. I don't I don't get it, but when you get in the river up mm -hmm. near the dam and you catch these things, they're full of those freshwater mussels yep. in the shell. Yep. You, you yep. get in the flats, they have those those real round. I don't know what exactly what type of clam that is. But they'll have literally a handful of clams in the shell, in their belly. Hmm. They're eating these clams. They eat the freshwater ones, the, the black freshwater mussel up in yep. the river off the hard bottom. They eat those. When they're out in the flats, they have those other, I don't know, you probably know what those clams are. but I don't. I'm looking actually. Uh, they keep have bellies up. full of them. I'm about to pull a picture up if I can find one here uh, quickly in the invasives count because uh, – it's amazing, and I've, I've heard scientists talk about, or you know, folks that are doing these observations, especially watermen. Um, you, you catch those big ones, and you can almost feel the clams rattling around in their belly when you're holding it. And it's strange, it's crazy, but they eat. They we we. It's no surprise that they eat um, shellfish. We know that. I, if I'm not mistaken, it's either a seasonal thing for the for the adults, but I feel like it was a younger ages that they were eating them with more prevalence or observed with more prevalence. And then, I've, if I'm not mistaken, they become piscivores at least at a certain time of year, and are eating fish. And so that's where they're very different from a, a, a channel cat or bullhead or something else, from a meat quality perspective. And 
I don't know. I think I would hope that there are some studies being done on some blue cap meat and what might be in it um, as far as contaminants and such, because a lot of times um, fish that are eating on the bottom, especially in harbor areas like Baltimore, sure. um, they're going to carry some of those heavy metals and things with them. And that's such an important thing to talk to people about, especially with these fish that are known to be good to eat, but you got to be careful about where they're coming from. I, I would guess that just given blue cats kind of proclivity to, to feed all throughout the water column. I, I mean, I've even seen guys catching them right on the surface on flies and stuff on the Potomac. Um, so they're definitely more aggressive and me, I'm a big fan of eating them. I actually wrote a, uh, a piece for uh, the Bay weekly a couple weeks back and I made bluefish piccata with some fresh garden, uh, garden tomatoes added in. So I highly recommend that to anybody. It was nine seventy five at my, uh, my whole foods right down the street, which, you know, it's good. I supported a local fisherman. So anyway, wow. let me find, let me find some pictures here. You guys chat for a bit. Well, you know what I find interesting talking about the clams is it, <laughs> I was going to say 20 years ago, but it was actually 30 years ago. <laughs> we used to catch trophy stripers on bait in April off love point every one of those fish had soft clam shell in its belly when you cleaned a fish every one of them crunched up soft clam shells they always used to feed on them They'd like every one of them for your viewing displeasure maybe um, oh look at that on the half shell on the half shell that was clams casino or whatever <laughs> um right there in a blue cat um let me see if I can find another one. We have tons of these fish turned in. There you go. Yeah, man. There's another one. No surprise. Now, I wonder how... Uh, whoops. Let me go back here. I wonder how... Can't show Can't show locations. Can't show locations. Um, I wonder where... Uh, who's going to figure out how to catch these things on clams? Now, you know, clam, razor clams maybe. I'm sure that's a good bait for them. Have you ever tried yeah, that? I mean, I haven't just because, you know... Yeah, I don't. I don't want to spend a dime. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not buying clams. I'm steaming them if I do. I'm yep. not feeding them to a blue cat. You know, fair enough. Fair enough. You know, I, 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 mud shad are free. Peanut bunker are free. You know, eels. I trap eels, so they're kind. Of, they're free. There's a little bit of effort and time that goes into that, but yeah, I, I bet if you took razor clams and put them on a hook, I mean, if it. it Jeez, if you're anywhere around channel catfish, they're going to get your bait. They're going to get. They're going to eat that clam quicker. You know, if you want to get down deep and get in a hole. I mean, channel cats are such opportunists. Yeah. I mean, they will. They will eat anything, and and they don't seem to be, you know, picky. You know, sometimes you've got to you got to soak a bait in front of a blue cat, and you know they're down there. You've marked them, but they're just not eating. And if there's a channel cat, I've never known a channel cat not to eat. <laughs> Whether it's a night crawler, a shiner, a spinner bait, a worm, a flu the channel cats are there, they're gonna eat. They just they just seem to never pass up a meal. And if if you had a clams, I am channel cats would beat everybody else to them. Absolutely. I just found a really kind of uh oh, I lost it. I had a really cool oh there it is. Let me see something real quick. I know I'm hidden. Doing that on purpose. I keep picking the wrong one. There's a picture you're about you're about to see that is. Uh, I was trying to look for the. Oh, gosh darn it! I picked. I pressed the wrong button. There's a, a picture you can see. I'm going to see if I can find it. But the uh, the stomach. I have to scroll through all this stuff. Um, the stomach is just covered in clams, and I think there's a hunk of meat there, like a fillet. And I'm not sure if that's actually the fish's meat or uh, something that came out of his stomach. And a lot of our participants. In the invasives count, what I'm going through right now, um, we'll post notes. And that's what I was looking for. A gentleman named Wayne Gast uh, has definitely submitted a lot of fish, uh, a lot of stomach contents fish, too. Um, but anyway, it gives you an idea. Oh, there's, sorry, there's there's probably close to a thousand entries right now. I have to scroll through all of them. A thousand entries? That shouldn't take you too long. Maybe it's not that many. I could be exaggerating, you know, as a fisherman, that's what we do. All right, here we go. Here's some from the Potomac River. Um, give me a second here. See all the all the shells in there? Yeah. So, you know, folks, just so you have an idea, uh, this is exactly the kind of stuff we're giving Maryland DNR so they can understand it um, and, and keep an eye on what's going on with these fish and learn more about them. 
Um, also, you know, blue cats, I, I talk about the meat quality, um, but they, uh, the meat quantity <laughs> isn't as high as you might like, um, but it is good. And so cleaning them, definitely, you can see that rib cage right there. You know, you get the meat off the shoulder here and, and then, you know, you kind of lose all this belly area. Um, also, just from a, a health perspective, um, it's important for folks to realize that the fat in fish is generally where things are going to be held that might be bad for you. And, you know, that's from a, a long life. Like, so big fish, you're better off letting them go anyway, because they're usually good breeders. Um, maybe not for blue cats, but, um, <laughs> but big fish are going to contain that meat and their belly fat. And uh, that, that is a viable product. It's perfectly fine to eat. But if folks are really focused on being health conscious, just, just understand that about all fish. Uh, the more fat, the more likely that you're going to have some, uh, maybe some contaminants or other things that are going to be in there. Kids, yeah, almost toxins are fat soluble. Yep. Yep. That's where they end up. Oh my goodness. Here's a, uh, I didn't think we were going to show like, um, like one fish, of those, those shows, remember when they used to do like surgeries on TV, on, like public television. That was like a long time ago. That's what I feel like I'm doing right now. So there that's it is. Just, that just boggles my mind. Cause they, they gobble those things up. Yep. Well, I do too. I mean, hey, let's go to the raw bar. <laughs> so, all right. So let's get back to some questions. Um, so this is Cullen coming through in Jasmine's uh, Facebook account. Are you cast netting mud shad? How are you catching your own mud shad? Has anybody ever done that? Yeah, I I have thrown the cast net on them. Um, just like the peanut bunker. Right now we have the young of the year. Right. And then you'll also have classes of, of gizzard shad that are around six, seven inches. And the same thing, gizzard, uh, gizzard shad don't seem to swim in the, the vortex, don't seem to swim in circles, but they swim in what I call ribbons hmm. along the edges. And they're, yeah, here in the river. And, you know, I might be spoiled from being in the river, but man, they, they're right, they're literally right at your feet and they're in huge ribbons and they show themselves, you know, they, they come up and I don't know what they do on the surface. They gulp air and they splash around. So they show themselves, you know, obviously from being on the river, I know where they are, you know, they hang out in certain spots more than others. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I snag them. <laughs> I'll be fishing. I'll be jigging. You know, there's a lot of gizzard shad, a lot of mud shad in the Susquehanna river. You'll end up snagging them. And it's like, you know, I, I don't, you know, I usually let them go if I don't have a pair of gloves. <laughs> I, I, if I'm cutting up gizzard shad, I'm wearing surgical gloves, man. I'm wearing the latex because <laughs> they are the oily. And that's why they're such a good bait. Like most shad, any type of shad, extremely oily fishes. And it permeates your skin. You, I don't care. You put lemon juice on them. You scrub them with Dawn. Yeah. Later on that day or the next day, you rub your phone. Oh, man. Your hand still stinks. Do not touch gizzard shad under any circumstances. Never take a picture of a gizzard shad like it's a catch under any circumstances. Do not touch that fish. I, I, I remember in the old uh, tidal fish days, you know, folks calling them Patapsco permit. And I'm like, what are they talking about? And I think I went out to Brandon Shores and snagged a bunch trying to catch big rockfish. And I, I learned that mistake uh, oh, the hard God. way. Insidious slime, yep. Yep. not as yep. bad as a snakehead, but <laughs> I mean, there's nothing worse. It's the thing snakehead's not, not as uh, aromatic. But, <laughs> it's yeah, correct. correct. But it, it, it's a slime making machine. <laughs> it's just, it, I, I just shake my head, man. I there's nothing about that fish that's appealing. <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing. I don't care. For, you said it's great yeah. for bait. That's that's yeah. something. They can have a cult following, but there literally is nothing appealing about. Oh, them. the snakehead! I got you. I thought you were talking about mud shad still. I was no, no. The, poor, the poor lowly mud shad is feeding so much of what you love to catch. It feeds bald eagles. I was going to say, like, I want to be a I champion of mud shad. Dave, you make a great point. The gizzard shad has. I, I think in, in some areas it's become problematic because when it reaches a certain size, it's nothing eats it, right? Just an and, eagle. An right, impossible. an eagle. And Otter. now all of a sudden we have all these blue cats, right? And we've mm -hmm. got these snakehead. And 
that's the saving grace. I think there's enough gizzard shad to go around. I really do up up here in the upper Bay. I think that's a saving grace for, you know, all the wonderful species that we, you know, we don't want impacted by these invasives. There's hundreds of probably millions of tons of young of the year and, you know, several other classes of gizzard shad in the Susquehanna river. Well, now here's something else to think about. Gizzard shad are filter feeder, correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So how much water does a gizzard shad filter in a day? Maybe a gizzard shad, a big gizzard shad filters more than an oyster. I don't know if they filter in the same way that like a menhaden does. Like a menhaden's gra grazing on phytoplankton and algae. Um, and that's where the great, the, the filtering com component comes in. I, I just don't know, and, but I, they are different than menhaden. Me neither. I'm just asking the question. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. Oh, yeah. It could be a double bonus. Yeah. Right. But I, I think that's going to help the overall picture that there's just there's just such an abundance of them because that's all the yellow perch eat in the Susquehanna in the winter. And if you you winter blue catfish, which you can, there's quite a few people that do. Um, they're they're just they're just literally their bellies are a shad paste. Yeah, yeah. Matt's asking, uh, what depth would you fish blue cats at now? Cooler water, deep in, in uh, deeper holes. I, I tend to fish deep for them, period. I mean, when they get up in the river, there isn't really no deep water. But in the winter months, I'm crazy deep in the Sus. You know, the, uh, people that don't know the Susquehanna, you know, it's when you get from Perryville south to the top of the flats, it's 60, 70, 80, even 90 foot water is 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 consistent, you know, is the norm. Yep. Um it doesn't seem to be where those fish are now. That's that's definitely a winter congregation. Yeah. But now 20 feet is plenty, you know, 12, 18. It, it doesn't seem to matter what, that it does when things really cool down. They seem to dot. They seem to drop into those holes. You know, yeah. I don't I don't target the crazy deep water now. I would say 12 to 30 feet at the most. Yeah, I think it's transitioning to I mean, these cold nights are definitely changing things relatively quickly. We've got nine days till this tournament. Um, and so I would imagine they'll be coming up a little bit. And, and, uh, but like you said, I mean, there's plenty of, plenty of really good spots. And Matt, I know, I know you know how to catch them. Uh, Matt's participated in the invasives count and actually just got his Traeger grill uh, from the Kent Narrows tournament. Um, the Traegers were back ordered, but Matt's going to be uh, grilling up with his brand new grill all because he was helping out with the invasives count and uh, decided decided to do the invasives division of the Kent Narrows tournament. So wow, he got a Traeger? Got a Traeger just for catching an invasive species the day of the Kent Narrows tournament. So he uh he got a Traeger, a Traeger tail gator. So That's pretty cool. I wonder if they can make a uh, a mud shad taste good. No. <laughs> <laughs> I you, <laughs> hey, they definitely make a they they definitely make snakeheads taste good. So there's no question. I mean, that's up here on the upper bay. That's the number one commercial fish. Yeah, is the gizzard shad. People yep. don't realize that it, it it's not it's not striped bass. It's not yellow perch. It's not white perch. It's a gizzard shad. That's our number one commercial speak commercially harvested fish by tonnage. Is the gizzard shad up this way? Yep. What's, I mean, what's the use for it? Probably it's bait. Not, yeah, it is bait. I know that one of the markets they have right now is Louisiana for crawfish bait. And uh, and it's interesting because crawfish heads and shrimp heads and stuff are coming. I guess shrimp heads are coming up for, uh, for crab bait. Um, exactly. So bait is is a big business. and It and is. God you wouldn't believe how far bait is shipped. Um, you would think it would be available local everywhere, but specific baits are being shipped a bit, uh, a bunch all over the place. Um, actually, Menhaden, um, there's a big demand in, for them recently because the herring fisheries are changing drastically in the Northeast. Um, the Atlantic herring population is crashing and um, management's tightening up the, the reins. And, and so Menhaden are becoming more valuable in the bait fishery for the North and in the lobster fishery. And uh, there's even actually an experimental thread herring fishery that we uh, were weighing in on and, and getting involved in, in trying to push back against it that they're trying to do off Jersey and have a, another purse saying bait based fishery, uh, off of Jersey. So it's always something to do. Always something to keep an eye on. Don't tell Omega. Yeah. <laughs> that, 
this one's uh, Lunds. It's a uh, you know requesting kind of a permit to do an experimental fishery, um, but on a species thread thread herring. I think threadfin herring. Threadfin. Uh, yeah, the, a species we have no knowledge of what their status is, um, no management plan, and you know we'll surely oppose it. Uh, those fish are, are important forage for a lot of other species, and uh, we've already done enough damage. So, again, depressing things. So, all right, folks. Well, we uh, we have been at it quite a while here. I think we're gonna maybe if no more questions pop up, I'm gonna run down and just give folks a reminder. You can always check out the great fishing reports at fishtalk.com, right? Fishtalkmag.com slash fishing reports and check out lots of stuff, regardless of whether you're participating in the Chesapeake Fishing Open. So that's Saturday, October 9th. If you cannot fish in it, we would love to have you come and clean up some trash. This is come as you are for as much time as you can uh, from one o'clock till four o'clock when the, when the party gets kicking off. Uh, at Nick's, if you help clean up trash, you get a free t-shirt. You get to come into the party. If you're fishing in the tournament and you bring us back a nice bag of trash that you picked up out of the water, hey, take some pictures of it and submit pictures of it, whatever you got to do. You're getting a free t-shirt as well because you're, you're pitching in to help clean up our waterways. Uh, and then we're going to have a great party, uh, both the captain's meeting um, the night before and um, and the actual the event at Nick's. There's a tent. There'll be plenty of space for folks to space out and enjoy themselves, have a great meal uh, and a great party celebrating the fantastic fishing that's happening right here in Baltimore. Um, shore fishing, kayak fishing, boat fishing, doesn't matter. Bounce around. Think of the different strategies and uh, and see what you can do. And again, remember that you have the, uh, the CCA Maryland link tree. It's been scrolled along the bottom the entire time. Bookmark this, bookmark it on your phone if you're active in CCA stuff, because just constantly, if you're thinking, all right, what's going on, Boop, click that button and it'll give you a link to just about everything we have going on. Um, and, uh, you know, so we always want folks to know what's happening to come out and participate. Um, I'm going to have, have a question for both of you. Let me click this. Lenny, what do you think the three fish stringer will be? What is the overall length for the winners? Ooh, that's a toughie. I think you're going to break 90. You're going to see 30, 30, 30 plus. Okay. 90 plus, 90 plus. I think so. I, I'd be surprised if you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, rock, rock, rock. Oh, no, I'm not making that bet. Rock, cat, I'm, cat. Yeah, mix a rock and cats. And if someone is bold enough and has a fast enough and shallow drift enough boat, they could put that 30 inch snakehead in there too. Yep. So what? from the Bay Bridge North, that's where you that's where you're limited. Tidal waters all the way up to the uh, the Conowingo, Maryland waters. Uh, Dave, what do you think? What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be something like 99, 101. You know, I, I think Lenny's right. I mean, it it shouldn't be too difficult to go out there and catch three blue catfish 30 inches. You know, you get that kicker snakehead or, you know, you get on the rockfish good somewhere. You know, 30 inch fish is, you know, I hate to say it because, you know, I, I can remember not too long ago, one day with Pete and it wasn't even the fall. We were summer fishing and we caught four fish, like 34, 35 inch stripers. Wow. Just, j just jigging. Yeah. And I was like, I mean, that was 10 years ago, maybe not even that. I'm going to say eight or nine years ago, you know, and that like Lenny mentioned the lumps, pools, traditionally mm -hmm. guys are catching 36s, bouncing those eels on the lumps on that pools. I mean, that's now you get a 30, you, you kind of feel like, Hey man, I got like, you know, it's, <clears throat> that's a quality fish. It is what it is, but yeah, that would be really cool. And I did have a question for you about yeah. the divisions from what I'm seeing some lucky angler and correct me if I'm wrong can get the three biggest fish simultaneously. What if he has the biggest striped bass, the biggest blue cat, the, <laughs> the biggest snakehead? I mean, technically could someone win $7,000? That's the way it reads to me. That's, That's insane, man. 
That's $25 that's a good entry. Day's work fish. Then that'll replace some of this tackle I got behind me. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. And it, yeah. it, you yeah. know, yeah, seven grand for a $75 entry. You can fish it alone. You can fish it with up to six people total uh, on a boat. And you get food and beverage at the captain's meeting, food and beverage at the actual party, the day of the tournament, and a shirt and all this other swag. So it's like... It's a pretty good deal. Have you reached out to the people at Subaru? No, I have not. You might want to send them an invite. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a good group of people that seem to be aligned with, with CCA's interests. Absolutely. Jones Subaru is a great friend of ours. And uh, in fact, all of the Jones family have been working with us a lot. And uh, if anybody's out there still listening and uh, wants to participate in any of this stuff, again, the link tree, but we'd love to have some companies come out, you name it, come out and please RSVP so we can plan accordingly on the food and t-shirt and everything else front. Uh, we're talking a, a week from Saturday, October 9th. Uh, fall is here. It's uh, It's time to celebrate some good fishing taking care of, uh, of Baltimore, uh, cleaning up our shoreline a little bit, and uh, and also engaging with some kids to get them fishing as well. So that's what you're supporting as part of this event. And uh, I said it earlier, the Baltimore chapter is coming back with a meeting next week, um, bringing folks together at uh, at Jerry D's on, I think, is that Hartford Road or Bel Air Road? Same thing. Same thing, close <laughs> enough. Northeast side of the city, out by the Beltway. Just Bloody Hill, Baltimore. Parkville, whatever you want to call it. Listen. <laughs> Uh, let's get back to Little Havana and have burger night. I'm still, hey. I'm still, I'm still trying to get over the fact that David said Baltimore with a T. Balmer, sorry. Balmer sorry. has a T in it. <laughs> what? what? I'm a Howard County guy originally. My wife, who's from Montgomery County, she she picks out certain words and says I Baltimore them, Balmer them, <laughs> and uh, and you know I, I always just call her yuppie. But anyway. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and thanks to everybody that's followed along. And uh, I hope to see folks on October 9th, whether you're cleaning up trash, catching fish, come on back the next, have a good time, celebrate what we all love to do, and that's uh, go fishing here in Maryland. And um, we'll see you soon. This is uh, episode 19 of What's on the Line. Thank you to our guests, and thank you to everybody for following along. Thanks. Thanks.